session of day three of UT Social Media Week 2016. Um, we have a great panel here for you, um, professionals from Scripps, and the title of the session is Scripps Lifestyle Studio, Life is Our Business. And you're going to hear all about the different Scripps brands um, and how they use digital and social in everyday um, business. We have some student ambassadors here that are going to take a couple of minutes and introduce each one of our speakers. But before they do that, I just want to remind you that um, we encourage you to post, tweet, share content about our event this week. And if, when you do, use the hashtag UTSMW16. Awesome. Yes. Sure. The baseball game today. Yeah. In case you're interested. Yep. All right. All right, so first up we have Nick Hollinsby. Um, he's an executive producer for Scripps Network Interactive, where he leads a range of strategic digital product uh, projects, including social media, social video initiatives, experimental web series, and short form video for HGTV and Food Network's digital platforms. Um, in 2005, he joined the Scripps owned Naples Daily News in Florida, where he served as the senior video producer. He earned his bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Kansas and has received many accolades for his online video work, including a Webby Award for the online video series, The House Counselor. All right, next we have Mariel Clark. Mariel S. Clark is editorial and programming, programming director of the lifestyle brand websites for HGTV, Travel Channel, Die Network, and Great American Country. Mariel leads the home and travel categories, digital editorial strategy and growth, generating ideas that attract a greater audience and increase revenue. Before joining HGTV, Mariel served as editorial, editor, editor of New York News website and is television producer on, on award-winning series for Food Network, Oxygen, and Discovery Channel, among others. We also have Mallory Ziegler. Mallory Ziegler is a community manager at Scripps Network Interactive who helps manage social media for HGTV, DIY Network, and Great American Country. Before joining Scripps, she worked on the social media teams at AutoNation and Lynn University in roles that centered on content creation and storytelling. At Scripps, Mallory was a part of a team that launched HGTVGardens.com, a community-focused gardening resource from HGTV. All right, and lastly, we have Dale Jolly. He is a social media manager, home category, Scripps Network Interactive, a social media manager for Scripps Network Interactive home category. Dale's passion is building and growing communities and conversations in the digital space. Dale has developed a diverse range of experience that he uses to engage and connect with consumers, influencers, and, con and content seekers across multiple platforms. And I guess I should have introduced myself too. <laughs> I'm Courtney Childers, um, and I will be moderating the session today. So let's give a quick round of applause to all of our Scripps participants. Are ready? Yeah, sorry about the delay technically there. We do work in digital, as Mariel said earlier. So. <laughs> So yeah, that was a great introduction. Thank you. I didn't, we don't have to introduce ourselves now, right? No, you're good. Awesome. Um, so um, this panel is about SLS, which is Scripps Lifestyle Studios, which is a brand new way of sort of packaging up everything we already did, only it's a way to explain it to advertisers and partners um, in a more clear way. So do you want to give the SLS Yeah, intro? give the SLS. So SL, we call it SLS because we like to shorten everything to three letters. So um, Scripps Lifestyle Studios, SLS, it's a, a new division that was created at the end of the year last year. Um, and it's, as Nick said, it's designed to drive our digital content across all of our brands, which is, I'm going to rattle them all off. It's a lot of them, and hopefully you guys know all of them. So it is HGTV, DIY Network, Great American Country, Travel Channel, Food Network, Cooking Channel, and food.com. I was like, and that last one. But, okay, my apologies to food.com. Um, and so it is about creating content as well as advertising solutions. So 
It includes videos, photos, social media, live digital video events, um, and then of course written word editorial. Um, it's across all of our sites, it's across all of our social media, it's across our apps, and it's across um, third party um, outlets as well like syndication, um, Snapchat, Periscope. Um, and so we actually have brought some examples that, that Nick is going to um, call up for us as, as we want to see some of them. So do you want to show the Lifestyle Studios, um, one of the teaser videos that gives a little, this is a little sure. bit of an overview of the Lifestyle Studios. Sure. So that one is the last one to load. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's see. It's a short one, though. Oh. Okay, so this is um, not really about telling you what life SLS is. It's more about just the emotion behind what we do. So it really is a teaser just to kind of give you a sense of what we're about and, you know, kind of like, uh, it's more about the feeling, less about the information. And I think it's about a minute long, so it's just, it's loading, but it's almost there. While we're waiting for it, does anyone have any questions about Scripps Lifestyle Studios? Or you guys can jump in anytime. Just as we say things, if you want to know more, just go for it. And while it's loading too, it might be helpful for you all to know your audience. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that we have a class in here from Haslam. So raise your hand if you're business majors. Is that right? Okay. There we go. Lots of business majors in the class. Right. Um, advertising students in, in the in the session. I see you all too. Public relations. Here we go. And comm studies, maybe? Any others? Did I miss any other majors? Tell us. Information, Information sciences. Well, welcome. Th thanks for being here. Any journalism majors? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah journalism too. Awesome. <laughs> good diverse group. Okay. All right. I think we're good to go. So again, this, this was launched um, right before we announced what Scripps Lifestyle Studios was. And um, it was uh, the very first thing we officially published as Scripps Lifestyle Studios. Life is our business. That makes us a different kind of digital content studio. We're different because we know that life is what happens when meals make memories, when houses feel more like homes, when getting there is as much fun because we get that life is better when people practice what they preach, walk miles in many different shoes. Never stop asking, what if? Our teams do that every day because life is what we do. Our lifestyle focus puts brands at the heart of life's decisions, big and small. At the center of moments where ideas become actions and promises become plans. We entertain and inform, and then we go further. We make content that matters. We help people make life better. And that's why we do life better than anyone. Cool. So that was it. Um, you know, as you can see, it's just about sort of that feeling that, that the copy that was written for that is kind of like our mission statement. So it was kind of like a corporate um, announcement, if you will, that uh, verbatim read what we had come up with as our mission statement. Um, the voiceover was Meg Ellen Cole, and that's important because she's one of our first digital talents that exclusively digital. And uh, we found her on YouTube, and she's really been kind of with us through the whole process of working with different kinds of video and also doing some flat content. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about her more later when we talk about a series that launched today that Mallory sort of co-created, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, we have a bunch of videos. So what we thought we'd do is go through some questions. Yep. And then um, when it comes up, when the time comes up, hopefully the videos will actually play. And so if you awesome. want to go ahead with the Yes. Questions. So I think a good one to get us started is, um, how do you find new ideas for digital video projects? What drives those new ideas? So like Mallory, Mallory and Dale are um, our social media managers. Like I'm just going to yell. <laughs> um, Mallory and Dale are social media, um, I know I'm not allowed to use the word guru, so I won't say that, but um, ma social media experts. And so they, I feel like a lot of the ideas 
we get come from kind of what our audience is searching for, but they also kind of come for what, from what our social audience is doing. We have a lot of um, new projects, new video projects that we're working on that are social only. So I feel like you guys could talk a little bit about where some of those come from. I, I can speak to that just because one of my ideas is the project that Nick just mentioned that is launching today. It's a, it's a series that's digital only called Cube Takeover, where we go into office spaces and make over people's cubicles. So, And that was just a product of a brainstorm session that we set up. I think one of the great things about scripts in particular is that ideas don't just come from the creative set necessarily. You know, whenever we kind of have these brainstorming meetings, it's great that you pull in people from all the different departments to kind of share ideas, and everybody's ideas are, you know, equally considered as potential projects, I think, um, which is a big part of what we do. But um, our audiences are another big part of that. I know on, on Facebook, we don't always get the chance to reply to everybody, but when we read some of the comments, people are very vocal about telling us exactly what they'd like to see on our TV, on our TV channels at any moment of the day. But, um, and we only have 24 hours in a day to air TV programming, but since we can't always give them what they want there, we have all the space in the world on digital to kind of take that feedback and create video content um, so that provides a lot of um, our ideas for us too. I feel like our 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 lifestyle studios content, a digital content especially, kind of takes one of this is oversimplifying it, but Nick, correct me if I this is too oversimplified. It takes one of two directions. Um, some of it is very much designed to entertain and inspire. So that's like our our travel um, webisodes that take you to beautiful places that I hope you get to go. Um, our the Cube Crashers series, so or the Cube Makeover series that kind of inspires you to to take you know the space that you're working in and make it something spectacular and personal. We also have content where people just want to know like how do I switch out a ceiling light for a ceiling fan? Like very practical. How do I actually physically do something? So some of our content is more inspirational and trend and fun and entertaining, and then some of it is very kind of practical on actually how to do things, how to cook um, chicken lasagna, how to, um, like I said, make over a ceiling mm -hmm. fan. Yeah. That was a really glamorous example. Um, and one thing I'd add to that besides, you know, the fact that we really do kind of take everyone's ideas, uh, everyone that works at Scripps is very creative, almost everyone's passionate about lifestyle, either home, food, or travel, or all three. And uh, so I would say to everyone, like, another way we find ideas is by finding digital talent already doing some cool stuff out there. And I don't know if anyone's ever like published their own stuff for life, in lifestyle media, but a lot of times we find someone that we feel like is kind of got a voice or a, a perspective that we think it matches ours, and so we'll partner with them. And through that, we'll cultivate a bunch of new ideas. And so that's another way that we've been doing, more, maybe increasingly doing, um, as we try to ramp up our content. So how do you work with content creators? Um, That's a good segue. Yeah. Any tips for creators who might be doing um, lifestyle media on their own? Because um, I know that our students are really, really interested in the kind of the buzz term of content creation. Is, is anybody doing their own lifestyle media stuff? Anything in food or home? Like blogging or blogging? video? Doesn't have to be video? Have Nobody. Have half in. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, I think we use um, a couple things. One is just editorial gut, just looking at it being like, does this have potential, you know? And Marielle and Mallory and Dale and everyone in the team is really good at knowing what our voice is and being able to identify something that matches it. And the second thing we do is we use data. And that's something we've been doing more and more of. So um, a couple of the projects that I, that I helped launch, one of them, HETV Handmade, where we worked with crafters, we used data, um, a lot of data. I mean, we sorted through um, you know, hundreds of thousands of creators and tried to identify ones that were on the rise so socially, and then took that list of about 10 to 50, and then started vetting them with editorial gut to see which ones are at the top. So a lot of times we use data. So you know, we don't only use data. We never look at someone's social size and say, like, oh, yeah, they're a star, so we definitely want to create video with them or we want to create content with them. We definitely um, do look at it, and it's a way to surface new people. Um, so as you kind of have your own social footprint and you communicate socially on social media, it does kind of play into our finding of new people. 
Um, so it's kind of a combination between data and um, editorial judgment. So what, when you talk about data, um, I think that's a really um, important issue right now with digital and social. Um, what tools are you using in terms of aggregating that data or um, being able to maybe identify influencers in your space? I feel like Dale has some, you have some slides that show some of the numbers. Oh, is this a good segue for your slides? into that so yeah we can we could run them now sure. okay so Dale slides without video in bed that's got to be it I'm just go for some of you. Oh, look at that all right so I'm not sure how this may not really tie into your question but we'll we'll, we'll make it get to it in a roundabout way but so we do have a lot of tools. Um, this is more outward um, consumer facing, but I mean, it's always a way of kind of identifying our influencers. I actually, part of these tools does show um, influential followers, um, people who are more passionate about our brands, but um, I don't know if, you, I'm sure you all, who, who watches Bravo? Do, um, <laughs> um, you've probably noticed um, a lot of times during encores of like Real Housewives or anything like that, they'll, you'll see Twitter scrolls um, that are pretty prevalent. Um, we've done a lot of that in the past couple of years and those work really, really well for us. So um, we're able to create event-driven um, viewing times where we can actually get people more engaged by pushing them to a hashtag and having them interact with our shows using that hashtag for a chance to see their, their tweets on air. So that's a good way of identifying people who are really passionate about the brand and servicing those higher influential people. Um, sure. Um, talking about influencers, um, talent is probably our hugest influencer section because you know they're, they're highly incentivized, they have their own built-in fan base, um, they're very connected. Our talent is very social savvy. They're very engaged. Um, they get the value of social. Um, so they're constantly reaching out to their fans. And um, this is just a kind of an illustration of the past actually 30 days uh, um, with our two of our priority talent, um, Chip and Joanna Gaines from Fixer Upper, um, looking at just the Twitter um, the, the Twitter interaction, um, we were able to garner uh, 462 million impressions in 30 days, 50,000 mentions of the show, of the talent. Uh, Property Brothers, 111 million impressions, 20,000 mentions. Um, so that's just, that's just kind of a way that we um, utilize our talent. Um, and like I said, they're a great um, section of influencers, and we have a direct line to them, so we can kind of hit them up for assets um, and digital resources um, to help us promote our shows. And that's kind of along the lines of what Nick does, but it's more of a raw, gritty experience. Um, for instance, um, if we know that Chip and Joe are filming, we can hit them up and say, someone turn on their iPhone and let's see some outtakes from Chip, or someone give a shout out to their fans. So we're able to utilize a lot of that content on social because it works well in that space. It doesn't have to be polished. Their fans are really passionate. They want to see the, the gritty side of what our talent are doing as real people. So um, that's been a good way of um, kind of partnering with our talent um, to get that kind of content that um, promotes their shows and promotes um, any kind of destination viewing that we're trying to get out there. Oh, yeah, so what tool you use to get this data? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask Dale if you wanted to talk about like what tools you use to gather all that stuff. Yeah, so we have a partnership with um, Adobe, Adobe Social, um, who does all of our uh, social media publishing, so we're not constantly having to work 24-7. We actually get to sleep, so we can, we can schedule posts, <laughs> which is really nice. But uh, another portion of, of that tool is that we get a lot of metrics reporting, and we can see... Um, all of our, from all of our um, popular hashtags, what things are trending, um, what days they're trending, what people are saying, and we can kind of take that data back and, and manage it up to our programming team and, and to Nick and Marielle as far as 
what content we think would work well in the space. Um, this is just a look at some of our celebrity fans, and and it really doesn't have. I mean, it's definitely a, a major influence type of conversation here, but um, it's just cool, and I just wanted to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, as we're branching out and as we're kind of using more interactive tools like on our, on our Twitter scrolls and polling, we're, we're seeing that our demographic is lowering. We're actually reaching you guys, which is actually awesome. That's kind of our goal. And just a, a, an evidence of this is, you know, we have a lot of celebrity fans who watch HGTV and they're marketing back to their audiences, their fans about their love for HGTV. So that's lowering our demographic, it's expanding our reach, and it's kind of inserting us more into pop culture. Do you pay for any of those? No, this is totally organic. This is, yeah, this is totally organic. These, these, are, these are celebrities who love HGTV. Hers was a case where um, her closet was featured in an editorial package that we launched, and I think she was giving a sort of a shout out to her designer who uh. did. But I, don't, I mean, from our side, I, there was no, I mean, that was still still organic, but um, pretty exciting. And do you have the one from today? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the reason we were late is because um, 30 minutes ago, um, Cher tweeted about one of our shows. So we were just, <laughs> we were just too excited to get in the car. Uh, that's not really the reason we were, we were late. That's an acceptable um, reason. So. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Got an excuse now. So, and if you ask who Cher is, you have to leave the room now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was pretty exciting. What so. So Adobe does a lot of that for us. Uh huh. And we we also have um, a license agreement with Sysmos, so we're able to kind of see sentiment and see some of those trending and and things like that. And plus. To be honest, Mallory and I are constantly looking at it. So a lot of it is just manpower. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I would say 85% of it is is tools that we use, but a good portion of it is we're on there all the time and we're and we're checking and we're looking. So, um, can we not? Can we play video? Yeah. Uh, do you know what the? File I'm going to play is? video one. Um, just going back Del, to um, Del video one, got it. Let's see if I can get rid of the interface here. Perfect. Yeah, going back to what I was saying about our on-air scrolls, I, w I wanted to play an instance. Um, so New Year's Day is when we really do a big push to these kind of event viewing things. Um, we do on-air promos, um, asking people to engage with our hashtag, which is HGTV New Year. We enlist our priority talent to tweet all day on New Year's Day. That's how amazing our talent is. Then they they do it. Um, so and then and then thirdly, we display um, users' tweets on air all day during New Year's Day. So there's like a trifecta of of incentive here for our fans. They they get to see their tweets on air. They get to interact with their favorite talent. Um, so this is a case that happened actually New Year's Day. We um, does anyone know who Ellen DeGeneres is? <laughs> um, so Ellen has a, a design show with HGTV, um, which actually just finished for this year, coming back next year, so stay tuned. Um, we were able to work with Ellen's social media team to tweet on New Year's Day. We were able to capture that tweet, display it on air on HGTV New Year's Day during one of our highest viewership moments. Um, so, if you were sitting at home on your couch watching HGTV, this is what you would have seen come across your screen. And pay attention to the lower. All right. That's my nice little outdoor piece cloth here. And I've pieced together some cushions. I'm putting the cushions in the middle and then I'm going to lay the wood on top. Okay. So it doesn't seem like much, but actually it's pure, a pretty huge deal because we're talking about three major th reasons why it's pretty huge. First of all, that was our top tweet of the day. It was the highest retweeted of the day. So when you're talking about this promotion, um, we got 
we got attention from not only our fans on social media, but we got Ellen's fans on social media, which is going to be a, a pretty big cross-section of uniques, not duplicated. Plus, we got um, people who may not be on social media, but they're watching HGTV. So we got three potential huge numbers of impressions that saw that tweet promoting that show. And it was, it was free promotion. So um, that was a pretty significant bit of promotion that we got. Cool. You have and a second video on there. Did you want me to play Yeah, that? I want to play that one video and then I'll be done. And okay. we can talk about something else. <laughs> but this next video is just going back to um, how we're able to get a direct link to our talent for just behind the scenes stuff. I just want to show you a little clip of what we've kind of done over the years. It's, it's kind of raw, it's real gritty, but it's really high value to fans who are passionate about these talent because it shows, again, the realness of them. And it's just, again, another another content piece that we have. It's a library of promotion we have, and it's free free promotion, so go ahead. Just got a tweet. All right. It says, the brothers are my favorites on HGTV. That's so sweet. Thank you. So me and Chewy want to thank. Okay. <laughs> oh, my. So maybe it wouldn't work. <laughs> Okay, October 11, 10, 9 Central. That's the time. Get in where you fit in. Why? Because Vanilla Ice goes Amish, CT2. You don't want to miss this one. You did your continues. Nice. Good. See if I'm in again. Yeah! Woo! Strong. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. From our family here, it's back to Thanksgiving from the farm, and God bless. Baby, baby, be nice. See you later, guys. So that's just a snippet of, of a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we've been able to get from talent. And again, it's it's really consumed very highly by our fan base. Um, so I think that's all. I I, wanted, I had one more slide, and then I'll be done. Uh, okay. Looks like this is. It's not on the screen anymore. Oh, we can move on to something else. It looked like the fourth slide's the last one, so the one with the, yeah. Oh, well, we can take a question. Okay. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll self-admit, I'm a big fan of Chipper and <laughs> Joanna Gaines, um, Fixer Upper. Anybody else? Fan? Okay, so how did you all connect with the gains in order to? Um, I mean, what's the process going from just owning a small business and having a design shop, construction, et cetera, to you know booming talent for a major lifestyle brand? How did that work? I mean, I know this story of how the show got on the air. I don't you know, tell the story but that uh, but I, I, it wasn't digital. more kind of directly. Yeah, the digital <laughs> side. So a lot of the stuff we're working with is the is the. Um, digital originals or the pieces of the digital content, oh, I guess I should have this, the pieces of digital content that are um, related to TV shows. But if you know the story, then you go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so we don't, yeah, we don't actually, you know, we're not a part of, like Mariel said, we don't um, uh, green light shows. Right. We do digital shows. assets. So sometimes they're directly associated with the on-air shows. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not. Um, I've personally not done, I've done one shoot with them, and um, I did hear them talk about the story, and so I know kind of how yeah. it got started. It's only been a few years that they've been on, and it's amazing how their relationship is really just, I mean, I think it's the only time that a talent has actually surpassed HGTV in terms of trending above the brand. Um, so they've really, it's been ha happening really quick, but the pilot is so funny because Chip is um, completely personalityless. Like he's just scared in front of the camera and Joanna is just leading it. And so they are kind of about to like, I don't know, call it a failure. And they're all kind of like, this isn't gonna work. And the last day of shooting, they got this um, boat that Chip had found that was kind of ended up being a disaster. And the two of them just kind of 
made it work on this boat for the last day. And because he stopped thinking about the cameras, it's like this magical connection between the two formed. And that day, the producer is like, okay, this is definitely a hit. Like, this is exactly what we need to be doing. So it almost went from this terrible thing to, a, to an amazing show. And then, you know, it's just, as far as how they develop the show, I mean, I think it's just developed around the relationship. So do you, um, because I know that both of them have a very large following on social media, because they're, they're basically a brand themselves, but they also represent the script brand as well. How, how do you manage what they can and cannot, or is there any type of social media policy with your talent, or do you offer like training for them? Um, I think this is an interesting perspective. So. Um, so they're a unique case in that they were kind of a brand before they came on to our brand, okay. <laughs> like uh -huh. you said. Uh -huh. Um, and we do have policies for talent, um, and I guess the great thing about Chip and Joe is that they've been very easy to work with and very, they haven't lost their heads um, with, with the fame, so they've really kind of stuck with our guidelines, and it is a give and take because they do have their own business that they're trying to promote, so they actually have several businesses that they're trying to promote. So um, we've kind of made them aware of, of that line um, from the very beginning, and, and they haven't crossed it, because I think they understand what we bring to the table in terms of um, our promotion for them and, and what we can do. So um, they've been a great partner, um, and they've really kind of, we haven't had to do any kind of, um, have any kind of special talks <laughs> that we've had to have with other with other talent to be honest so they're just great people so we've been lucky um, and they follow our policies and we won't ask you to identify those trouble <laughs> troublesome ones um, I do think it's important though we have a lot of students in the audience um, and I'm sure that you know scripts being a big name especially here in the Knoxville community was a was a big draw as, as, uh, in addition to you four as well um, so these students are really interested in what can they do to be sitting in the seat where you are in a few years. Um, if you wouldn't mind while we're working out this uh, tech issue, just walk us through maybe your path to where you are today, how you got your job at Scripps, what you think are maybe the best um, and most important characteristics for a graduating student that's about to approach the job market. Well, for me, you know, being in video production, there's way more tools available now to be able to publish yourself. And so that would be my first thing is to, you know, be very proactive about finding what you're passionate about and then, and then producing it. Um, if you want to do anything in video, I think that's really important. And when I look through contractors or job candidates, it's definitely not super important. It's polished. It's that, you know, do they have a voice? What are they, what are they interested in? Are they passionate about what they're doing? with whatever topic, whether it be home or food or whatever. So that would be probably my first piece of advice. I was gonna echo that. Um, you know, as, as young people with every access to publication you could really dream of, you know, at your fingertips is to kind of take ownership of your presence online or, you know, wherever the, uh, the environment is that you're interested in, you know, I mean, it's really, for us, it's digital, so it's online. But, you know, if you don't own your domain name on the internet, you should buy it uh, or a version of it. Um, if you don't own your online presence and how you present yourself, um, I think it's easy for that to kind of get out of your control. So, like, Google yourself often, control your online uh, identity, kind of build, I mean, it's, you probably heard it before, but sort of work on slowly building your brand, even if it doesn't have to do with professional work, even if it's school work, make sure it's visible and easy to find for employers. Um, you don't want people to have to go searching hard, you know, to find stuff about you. So, but when they get there, you want them to find stuff that they can be impressed by, so. And I would definitely recommend trying to get an internship at Scripps. Okay. We have awesome internships, and if you go to Scripps Networks Interactive, they're all listed, so I would do that. They usually turn into jobs, and they're paid, so it's awesome. Are they, I don't know if they're paid. They're mostly paid, right? In, uh, in our group, they are paid. Um, I don't know if they usually turn into jobs, but I can tell you we have definitely hired, um, we've had some amazing interns. We have quite a few right now. Um, uh, and we have people on our staff right the second that are that were former interns. Um, and we also have some job openings in our group now too. So, it's like 25 yeah. If 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we have Knoxville, here in Knoxville is the headquarters of Scripps Networks Interactive. Um, but uh, the New York office, particularly Chelsea Market, is the second biggest or almost as big. I mean, that's a very large, there's a very large New York presence there. Um, a lot of Food Network happens there. I mean, I don't know if you guys know, there's the Food Network Kitchens is up there um, in Chelsea Market in New York. There's actually a second office in New York. Um, we have an office in D.C. We have an office in Atlanta. Mallory is out of, out of our Atlanta office. Um, and then we have sales offices all over the country and the world. So we have a really big global presence and because we're um, a company with core values, anything that you learn or do in one office or in one department translates to other opportunities around the com company. So I know lots of people that have moved yeah, different Yeah, one different specifically off. I work with directly, she started as an intern, got a full-time job. Oh, sorry. She started as an intern in Knoxville, got a full-time job, and then she said, I just have to be in New York. Mm -hmm. And we actually allowed her to relocate her job because mm -hmm. of her sort of personal interest in being in New York. And She's it's worked awesome. out great. So, yeah. And she's actually, um, uh, if, if we show some other examples, she's like the producer behind some of them, too. Yes, yeah, so. I know she's doing a bunch of cool yeah. stuff. I saw another hand. And she's a UT alum, I believe. Oh, she is, yeah. Huh? Right. She was once sitting in this very spot. Yeah. That's awesome. I think I would also add to what everyone said, especially about building your brand. Um, you know, if, if you find that you can't find intern, internship opportunities, a good outlet, like especially if you're trying to get into something like Mallory and I do, like you know, social media management, um, go around to your local like volunteer places, and you know, a lot of these places they don't have any kind of social media presence, and and volunteer to build up um, their social media presences, or even businesses that they just they don't get social media. Take on a challenge um, of, of people that that don't get it and they don't have a presence and Offer to do it for free or for, for whatever. Um, that's, that's a great thing to put on your resume and you can put real actionable results you know, that, that you did to, to build something for a business. So, so another quick plug. So um, the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center is a group I work with a lot and they have awesome interns. And so they're always looking for people that have an uh, interest in social media. So if you haven't checked them out, I would definitely check them out. It's been a really good group of people to work with. I've been mentoring um, a high school student there the past year or so, and he's now getting contract work through Scripps. So it's been great. Well, and we also work on the content, the digital content side, all of us, and social. But for those of you who are here that are business um, majors or in, in advertising and PR, those are huge parts of our business as well. I mean, we I work with the advertising um, and ad sales teams on a minute-to-minute -minute basis on all of these projects. So there's there's the create the creative side of it, but there's also the business side of it, which is you know, um, we we make sponsorship deals with advertisers and help bring some of their products into our videos and into our editorial. That's kind of the point of the Scripps Lifestyle Studios is creating content um, that can kind of bring the advertiser message along for the way. So it's still a great piece of content. It's still stuff that you guys want to see. It just happens to have an advertiser in there too because you would be interested in where these products come from and how to get them for yourselves. So that is a whole big section of the business as well. And there's finance and legal and um, uh, IT and I mean there's just any any division that you think of that a big company needs we've got it as well so it's not it's not just the content there's all of the other important key pieces that that offer internships and job opportunities and and growth so do we have any questions about job search or scripts as a whole mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah let's get you the And we're using the mics just so you know because we're streaming live, so our audience online can't hear us. Yeah. Hi. Um, going back to social media, have you guys ever dabbled into social media takeovers with your talent or an employee? And kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't really actually have a lot of. Uh, I know we we do sometimes we'll do Instagram type of takeovers, and uh, with our talent, those are really popular. Um, but, and it kind of speaks to what Dale said about them being so professional and eager to work with us and happy to kind of lead into whatever we ask of them in terms of social and tapping into their audiences to kind of bring them over and make them our audiences too, if there's not a lot of crossover. But um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, oh yeah, okay, you want to talk about that? Go ahead. Uh, so we uh, have another division of uh, HGTV with products and HGTV Home is what we call it. We have a division of fabrics you can buy at Joann's and furniture from Bassett Furniture and we have all these partnerships where you can buy HGTV products and our design director for that, Nancy Fire, she gets to, she's got like the coolest job ever invented. She gets to go all over the world and just spot design trends for HGTV Home. And so she'll often take our Instagram account with her on those trips because she can gather content that we just won't have access to that she gets access to. So, um, and it's amazing if you scroll through our Instagram account to find those photos that she shares. I mean, they're just beautiful. She goes to London and, you know, Paris and really gets to scout some cool stuff for us. So, um, we love it when she wants to take over our account. It actually gives kind of Dale and I the day off when people want to come <laughs> do that. So, we're happy to do it. Um, yeah, but I think we've started, talk, started talking a little bit more about doing it with like bloggers and people who might not be as well known or, you know, on any TV shows. Um, that's part of kind of what is maybe coming down the pike for some of our home giveaway promotions, the HGTV Dream Home, things like that. So, Are you guys on Snapchat and thought of using, like sending it, the account to Chip and Joanne and doing it? Yes, uh, we're not on Snapchat okay. yet. <laughs> Food Network is, and you should check out their Discover every day, it's super fun. Um, that's maybe <laughs> maybe in the works, but uh, <laughs> not not quite yet. Yeah. Um, so back to Courtney's talking about um, boundaries with talent. Mm -hmm. um, we have done a few takeovers with like our our bad boys, the Property Brothers, Drew, Drew and Jonathan. Um, so in those cases, we kind of do rain down, and we're like, you send the content to us, <laughs> and we'll post it as you. Um, so. It's, it's, it's a different scenario based on who we do uh, this kind of partnership with. Like Nancy Fire, you know, she's, she's an influencer in, in a different right, and, and we know her voice and, and we trust her. Not to say we don't trust our talent and not to say we don't trust Jonathan and Drew, but their idea of, of a line may be a little bit further over than, than our brand comfort. So um, we do quite a few takeovers and they're always very engaging, but it depends on who the talent is as, as how we handle those. Gotcha. Well, I work in the Alumni Affairs Office, and we're trying to get alumni to take over, so I was just seeing how your system goes, but I think sending content would be a lot easier than having them <laughs> do it themselves. It, and it's <laughs> definitely a comfort zone thing, um, especially yeah. if it's something you're considering, you know, at the, at the get-go that you mm -hmm. haven't done yet. Um, I would recommend, you know, having them send you the stuff, and then you send it out as them. Gotcha. It's just, it's easier that way, too. Yeah. So that, that's a good segue into something that I was hoping to touch on today, too, and that is, um, I, I think, another buzz um, issue or topic in social media is video. Just the importance of video, how to use video on different social media platforms, with the emergence of Periscope, Facebook Live, some other live video um, options. Where do you all really see... Um, is live video something that really fits into the script? Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. awesome. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so you were asking about video in general or live, live video? Both, uh -huh. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, we're really excited about doing more live video through social because it seems like a completely different thing than what television production live video is. You know, television production live video is a huge process requires a lot of resources and it seems like social live video is what's really doing well is the opposite of that. It's things that kind of unfold on the screen as, as they're really happening and the users are kind of helping to shape the story or whatever it is that's happening. They're interacting um, and so it's very inexpensive to do. So we've been dabbling with Facebook live streaming and so far we've done a couple of them and we've got one coming up for the GMA Fest which is like behind the scenes of um, CMA Fest. CMA Fest, sorry. Um, the Country Music Awards Festival, um, and Jonathan Drew will be hosting that. Um, so anyway, our first experience doing it was a cookie party before Christmas, and Mariel actually moderated the comments. Um, I was just going to play a clip from it, so you can kind of see. This is this is us, yeah. We had a group here, here oh, we're here in Knoxville that were live in our studio, in our Scripps Lifestyles studio, studio um, in the headquarters. And we were having a live ultimate cookie party and it was going back and forth between us and Food Network. So 
we would do a live segment for like 25 minutes and then they would go on and do a live segment for 25 minutes. And as people, as our users were commenting and asking questions, we were answering them live on, not on the air, on Facebook. So that's just kind of the setup. Cool. Um, let's see. I was trying a thick layer of this on a chocolate chip cookie. It's also really good on oatmeal raisin cookies. Mm. Oatmeal raisin cookies are kind of polarizing, though. Really? Why? I think they're delicious, but I, I gotta say, raisins have been getting a lot of hate. When did you guys tell us? Do you like raisins in your cookie? Oh, we're getting so many faces. I wish you guys could see this. <laughs> Let us know in the comments below if you are team raisin or not. So we just. So there was a lot of produced moments. It was, a, like Marielle said, it was like an hour long, I think, total. It was five segments between us and New York. We had a lot of prepared stuff. We did a little fixer-upper style reveal. We had all these very cute things that played very well on demand. But this moment was something that spurred a lot of interest in our actual comment section. And it was something that was completely organic and unplanned. She just thought, oh, you know, there's two different kinds of cookies and people have an opinion on it. And the fact that it was clearly not scripted and off the cuff, I feel like did really much better than some of the other pieces of the show where we were very scripted and very prepared. Um, so that's why I played that. Um, so yeah, so I think we're gonna do more of this. It, we feel like it did pretty well. We, we got almost two million views. We had 12 million concurrence uh, live streams at, at, our, at our peak. Um, and uh, we didn't do a whole lot to promote it. I mean, we, it was kind of an experiment for us. So it was kind of a first thing to see if users are interested in it. And I think we walked away thinking, yeah, they're definitely interested and we wanna do more. Um, just to, p to piggyback on that, like, Facebook Live as one part of a wider sort of video strategy and kind of knowing where we want to be. You know, you mentioned Periscope and you mentioned, um, like she mentioned Snapchat, but we want to make sure before we just kind of like jump on a platform that we have, kind of like what Nick was saying, have a plan, have a strategy, what do we want to accomplish with this? Do we have the manpower to staff it? You know, can we create as much content as, can we feed the beast of content that comes with starting a new platform like um, Snapchat? So I think, um, that's kind of important. Well, and, and Food Network's doing, again, you should check them out on Snapchat. They're doing so awesome. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so um, as, does everyone know what uh, Snapchat Discover is? It's the brands that appear in little bubbles. You they can, can probably tell you what that is. I'm yeah, just we'll say. Know, I don't know. <laughs> this is your expert. So, so um, Food Network normally operates on longer production cycles than a single day, and so starting the Snapchat account required that they staff up. They have actually a Snapchat studio, they call it Studio H, which was actually just an office and now it's a studio. And uh, so they have a team of people that are focused on doing, you know, trying to push out five, six new pieces of content a day. And there's a lot of experimentation. The reason I pulled this clip is because it just shows how different some of the stuff we program on Snapchat is than what we would normally do. So, you know, it's a guy in Jello. So these would be the top snaps where you, you, know, you scroll down and you see more, more stuff. So clearly, you know, we're creating for the platform. We're trying out different stuff and seeing what works there. I'm like looking at a sponsor integration opportunity that was lost. <laughs> that brings up a good point, though. It may a have lot been. of what we do, we want to, like we said earlier, bring the sponsor messages in with it. So I'm actually looking at that and I'm like, oh. I'm looking at that and I'm going, oh, that was a sponsor opportunity that we did not take advantage of. But so there's a lot of times when you'll watch our content and you'll, you may see a brand name um, and it was kind of part of a sponsorship or sometimes because we're, we're food and culinary and travel and home experts. So a lot of times we just tell you what we think the best product is. Like if you're making, you know, a Spam burger, you can't do that without Spam. So sometimes we'll say, like, go buy a can of Spam. We'll probably never say go buy a can of Spam. That won't come from <laughs> me. But, um, but so sometimes we're recommending the, the best products out there for your home or the best colors for your home or the best, you know, hot sauce to make this particular um, dish. Um, and then other times um, we have a dancing can of whipped cream that could have been... Am I allowed to say sponsor names? Could have been Ready Whip. Ready Whip, it could have been you. Um, well, did you have a Periscope example too? Yeah, sure. Um, so Periscope is another one that we're definitely experimenting with in a much less formal way than Snapchat. So you know, talking about takeovers, that's almost how Periscope works at this point. Um, we've done it with a lot of the big talent where we maybe have one, someone from our team, like Abby there with them, or sometimes they don't have anyone with them and they just go live on Periscope um, on our behalf. 
Uh, this is one of the cases where they didn't have anyone with them. And this is Megan Cole, who's one of our digital only talent. Um, Hello, everyone. We are here in Brooklyn, New York. We're in my studio. We're We've beautiful. been collabing. I'm doing a whole office makeover. That's why I brought in this guy right here. So I created this little space over here. With are you ready? Yeah, we literally, I just finished putting this up. Amazing modern modular storage unit made by Dan. Dan May will be on Handmade next week. Organization, organization is key. key. You're right. <laughs> I love it. I love Thank it. You. So that was edited. It, that wasn't a live feed. But, um, you know, I think one of the things we've been doing since then is trying to be more responsive to comments and letting those maybe tell the story a little more. Because in that instance, there was no response to comments like in a lot of the periscopes. But, um, but yeah, I feel like, you know, there's almost no resource required to do that. It just make it turned on her phone and did it, and I feel like it added some value. So I think Periscope, I would say, is another thing that across the company we're just kind of experimenting with and dabbling and just another way to add value for viewers. Might be a good time to show, too, um, how we consider a piece of video content for our websites, but then we have to think about ways we want to cut it and shoot it for all the different social platforms. Um, you know, because video has become almost three or four times what it meant to us last year. I mean, the volume of video that we're posting on social has tri tripled or quadrupled. Um, you know, because of sites like Tasty on Facebook, I'm sure you guys have all seen, or uh, Nifty, uh, BuzzFeed has a lot of these sort of channels that are very niche. Like, uh, there's another great one called Top Knot. If you're into hairstyle stuff, it's just hair videos. It's on your Facebook feed. So in response to that, you know, we've kind of had to learn what uh, formats work best on what channels. So, um, you know, we we've now can take a, a video, a digital original shot for HGTV.com, cut it down into a square, add some text if you're going to watch it on your phone on Facebook without any sound, so you can kind of know exactly what's going on. And then we can cut that even further to 15 seconds to put it on Instagram, which they're just going to launch 60 second videos um, coming soon. I, we just heard the announcement this week, so that's exciting for us too. So um, we kind of, I brought um, the latte art one. Yeah. Um, There's one that says web. Perfect. Got it. Can we play? So that lives on our website. Uh, I believe that actually even gets an ad impression beforehand. And that's, that's the important part about our videos living on our websites is that advertising dollars go there so that you know, we, we, can, we can serve ads on HGTV.com. Do you want to see the chair now? Yeah. So this is the Instagram version. Same, but square, easier to fit on your phone. Literally the same video, but made you know made sure it was 15 seconds. And then you know thinking about all the other platforms that maybe aren't video centered. You know, for Pinterest, we've learned that people really love images uh, that show you three different ways to do coffee art or four different uh, pillow styles to throw on your sofa. So we have a lot of visual tools where we can create specific uh, visual graphics that are flat and maybe not video centered, but that get people to click through to. Um, to see that content online. So just sort of taking one piece of content and thinking through the life cycle of how that content is going to be presented on all the different social networks is kind of what I wanted to, to show there. So in terms of advertising, um, so the example that you showed for Instagram right there, is that just considered organic content for you all or have you all dabbled into the advertising space? Good segue. Um, we are not, that, so this, that's a lot of what um, my job entails. And we are not just dabbling, we are like head first into um, what we call um, uh, content integration um, and or content marketing. Um, so I actually brought some, I brought examples Yay. Of, um, of that. So we, we have a lot of different ways to get message, um, advertisers messages across. So we have a lot of very custom ways that live in ad space um, or, in, or in native advertising space. But we also have a lot of advertisers that want to be a part of our story. So our audience loves our content. I mean, like, who doesn't love to watch? A co I have another coffee video, so I hope everybody likes coffee. <laughs> um, but I mean, who doesn't like a fun cup of coffee? 
um, or tea or your beverage of choice. And so advertisers don't want to, you know, live over here in the in the big box advertiser on the screen. They want to be brought into the story. So I actually have um, a couple examples. Let's do that evergreen one. So this is, um, we actually had a longer version. This is part of something we call HGTV Holiday House. It's a um, digital only um, uh, event we do every year where we make over a house for the holidays, inside, outside. We do um, entertaining stuff, we do decorating stuff, all kinds, it's very fun. Um, and this is last year's house. One of the sponsors was um, Mr. Coffee. So this is what we call an, an evergreen version of a, of a social cut down. So this is what it looks like if there's no sponsorship involvement. So that was a part of our content. It's something we wanted to do anyway. I mean, it was it was a spiked gingerbread latte. Um, but when sponsors get involved, they love our ideas and they want to be a part of them. So that is when we make um, versions that we can also post on social or post on our sites that kind of bring the sponsor along. But we do it in a way that's not. Um, we, we are trying not to be in your face. I mean, these are these are very organic kind of inclusions of the sponsor. So if you want to play, this is the same video with the sponsor in it. Mr. Coffee. Do they pay? Do they, they do. I don't know if I'm supposed to share that. Um, we have, I mean, we have ad sales deals that are um, six figure ad sales deals. We have ad sales deals that are seven figure ad sales deals. Um, and yeah. Yeah. We um, we have. I mean, it, that that is. It's almost so complex. We have these giant, you know, advertiser plans, so they can buy. I mean, if you went to our website and you went to Holiday House last year when this was running, you would also see Mr. Coffee's logo, like in the corner. Um, when you watched the full videos on the site, you might see a Mr. Coffee pre-roll um, in front of it. So we have lots of different ways of putting them in ad space. This is one of the ways that we kind of bring them along in our editorial videos. And it, it does, um, there is kind of additional cost. There's additional cost because it's, um, we are including them in our story. And then also some things we do with them. I mean, integrating a coffee maker into a cup of coffee video is not groundbreaking. That is very easy to do. When that one came across my desk, I was like, yep, sounds good, we can do it. We get some more interesting requests from time to time where it's like, um, I'm not coming up with an example, time, but just an advertiser that's not air conditioning units for there you go. Um, um, yeah, really like air conditioning stuff. Yeah, air conditioning unit that has to be installed in the wall, and we have to figure out a way to make that. We either have to figure out a way to make that make sense in what we're doing, or find another opportunity for them that might live like in ad space. So we we try to really work with our advertisers and offer them a lot of options, either in the editorial side or the advertising side, so that they can get. Um, they can get what they want. If they if they lean more towards the ad space, I think it's um, more it's a little more expensive, but they get a, mo a little more say because it's it's very obvious that it's an advertisement. When they come along with us on the editorial stories, we have editorial control. So anything that we are putting out there has been blessed by us as as appropriate. So it's it's a ongoing discussion about you know can you put this advertiser here and how would you do that and what would that look like and um, uh, so I have lots and lots of examples of where advertisers have come in or, or not come in. So would you ever put two different brands in that same? Um, we, we have lots and lots and lots of videos that have more than one advertiser in them. We typically, typically just because we're making sure that we're, you know, if an advertiser is requesting that, that they get product placement in a video oh. or if that's part of the deal with them. Um, you might see other advertiser products in there. It probably wouldn't be a competitor, so we wouldn't have like a Mr. Coffee drip coffee maker and then a, you know, Breville one right behind it. Right. Um, but um, well, not get a in this particular house one. A... Exactly. Yeah. Now um, we we there's so many um, 
discussions that are had that typically we kind of stay away from that. The exception, of course, would be any of our big home giveaways like the HGTV Dream Home. That home is packed from floor to ceiling with sponsor products. So any video that you are watching in Dream Home, whether you actually see the logo or not, is, is a lot of um, beautiful sponsor products. I mean, it's the flooring, it's the cabinets, it's the tile, it's the sink, it's the curtains. I mean, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of things, but it's a beautiful space. And that's really, that's what our advertisers want to be a part of, is that we are creating this really beautiful, fun, um, inspiring content. And they, wanna, they want people to see that and think of them in that way as well. So we have about seven minutes left. Want to open it up to some questions? Here comes the mic. Hey, so uh, looking at uh, your sort of marketing paradigm of finding talent that um, coincides with the vision and values and whatnot of your company, um, do you think that that influences independent content creators to tailor a vision specifically for the purpose of um, sort of like hook and line fishing, trying to get an advertising agency to pick them up, even if it's contrary to the content that they actually want to produce. And in doing that, do you think that it's detracting from the audience of independent content creators that don't necessarily adhere to a vision that can garner advertising support? I want to make sure I understand the question. So you're saying that, that some, like a YouTuber, for example, like if they are starting to make their own content that would, that would um, be great for Home Depot, is that what you mean? So like independent creators? Yeah, to an extent. And then is that a problem? I, I can speak to that. I, mean, yeah. I think if someone's able to actually get an audience without being authentic, then they're extremely talented and one in a million. And some, I, I don't think it's, it's common for people to successfully do that. I think when you start telling your content away from what it is you're, you're really about, um, it just doesn't seem to work. I mean, one of our YouTubers, she does have kind of a persona on camera that's different than her actual persona, but it's still her, it's still like something she created and something she cares about. She didn't do it for, to try to get money from Home Depot or to try to score a deal with us. And it seems like it's very rare for someone to actually be motivated by that and then succeed, so. Also, what advertisers are looking for, I mean, I can tell you because my email inbox is full of them as we speak, um, what they are looking for differs from, from their initiative to initiative by advertiser and advertiser and agency and agency. So I think if you're trying to like please this one advertiser, you would close yourself off to so much more. So to Nick's point, it's so much better just to, to create content for whatever audience you're trying to reach and then um, the advertisers will hopefully follow. That's the approach we take on the editorial side, is we are creating content for our audience, and if the advertisers fit and come along, it's a win-win. And advertisers get creative, too. I mean, if, they, if someone has a large voice socially, they get creative to become part of their content. So it almost seems like it's the opposite. The advertiser is trying to change their marketing strategy to fit with what's popular, as opposed to the people that are doing cool stuff getting audience changing so that the advertiser will work with them. Um, it's, becoming, it's becoming one of those situations, too, where you don't know if they've been paid to say it or not. Did, any, did everyone, everyone watch the Super Bowl and watch Peyton Manning? Mm -hmm. So did you notice afterwards he was like, oh, I'm going to go drink a bunch of Budweiser's? Mm -hmm. did, did Budweiser pay him to say that, or does he just like Budweiser? You know, so it, you start to get in these fine lines where these people who have a following, sometimes they just like the brand and they say it, and sometimes they've been paid to say it. And that, I think that's part of your question, is the line is, is blurred so I actually don't know if he was paid to say that I don't think he was no. oh does he okay so in effect he was paid right. <laughs> so my question would be um, kind of back to the social content side um, when you guys are planning ahead and you're scheduling that content because I guess we kind of asked do you have a preference between Hootsuite um, sprinkler and social sprout social um, I know they're all kind of popular right now, and we're all trying to figure out which one would work best if we move forward learning one particular um, publishing platform. Um, so we have a license deal with Adobe Social, and they handle all of our publishing. Um, beyond that, we have, we have worked with Hootsuite before. Um, there was another, and this is the thing, you forget who, who you worked with. So um, um, I, I still like Hootsuite, um, and I use it sometimes off the cuff, and I like TweetDeck, things like that. Um, 
and I've heard a lot of great things about Sprout Social. So um, the thing is, every social media publisher is going to have pros and cons, mm -hmm. and you kind of have to dive in there, unfortunately, and and see what works what works for what you're trying to do uh, based on what some of their cons are. Do you? I feel like it's, it's similar to learning the basics of a content management system like a WordPress or a Tumblr. I feel like once you learn the basics of how some of those work, you can pretty much teach yourself platform to platform. Because where you go to work, if you get hired to do what Dale and I do, I mean, we didn't really get to, this is the system that was in place. And so it, it was kind of up to us to learn it. But a lot of the fundamental, I mean, the scheduling portion, the measurement portion, it's, it's all very similar across all the platforms. Um, so I think if you're comfortable with one, you can easily pick up all the other ones. Um, like a CMS, like, you know, you go from publishing job to other publishing job. If you've worked in a CMS, you can pretty much figure out where you're, where you're going. So I think you're, any of those. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that will pretty much end this right here. That is a good segue, though, to mention our next session. We're done for today with Social Media Week, um, but our next session is officially the open house for the new Adam Brown Social Media Command Center, which is right down the hallway. Um, and we have access to a wonderful product from Salesforce called Social Studio that actually does some publishing and monitoring and listening as well. So thank you all so much for coming, especially those that are outside the college. Thank you, thank you. Um, if you're interested in dropping by the open house tomorrow, it's free, open to the public, 10 to noon. Um, and there's some goodies for the first 100 people that come. So, Mariel's got you. some HGTV swag too. Oh, awesome.